in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ushers, go right ahead. I'd like you to grab your Bibles tonight, if you would, and I'd like you to go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And is my daughter in here? I thought I saw Victoria a little while ago. She just slipped out. Donna, can you, can you ask Victoria to make me a coffee? It's just going to help my throat tonight. I need something to coat it. I need a little touch of hazelnut to, to coat. <laughs> Matthew 16. Well, I'm glad it's warm in Sarasota. I'm about to get on a plane at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning and fly to Indianapolis. And it's going to be pouring snow there. And I am ministering tomorrow morning and tomorrow night and Monday night and Tuesday night in good old Indiana. Amen. You know, there can be fire in the wintertime. <laughs> be praying for me this week. I really believe that God is going to do something very significant in the city of Kokomo, which is one hour north of Indianapolis. And this is a city that desperately, desperately needs the kingdom of God, and um, I may say more about that later, but pray with me and pray for me this week. Would you do that? Would you do that? Amen. Awesome. Awesome. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can hold and cling to your word and believe the word of the Lord because your word is truth. Your word is truth, and your word is spirit, and it is life. And so, Lord, tonight, I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that is upon the Word. And I thank you for anointing me, Lord, and calling me to preach the gospel. And it's such a privilege, Father, to preach the gospel. So, Lord, tonight, I pray that you will make me very effective, very effective as your servant to impart the Word of the Lord. And, Lord, I want to declare tonight that Sarasota in this county, in this region, shall become a stronghold for the kingdom of God. And people will say, heaven has come there. And people will come from the north, south, and the east, and the west to encounter the living God in salvation, and miracles, and deliverance, and healing, and wholeness, and total victory. In Jesus' name, our city and our region is destined to become a stronghold for the kingdom of God. And I say, Holy Spirit, make us an embassy of heaven. Hmm. Make us an embassy of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are you in Matthew 16? I, I actually meant Genesis. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Are you there? I want you to write this down tonight. The embassy of heaven. The embassy of heaven. That's what I'm going to speak about tonight. Because this is what the Lord is speaking to me about. <clears throat> Just so you know, I don't, I don't regurgitate Bill Johnson's messages. <laughs> I, I don't regurgitate Lance Walnow's messages or whoever. You just fill in the blank. I just, I just don't do that. Amen. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? But this is what the Lord keeps courting me and speaking to me about. And I believe that the Lord is courting me and wooing me and wooing us into a greater revelation and a greater understanding of what is actually available to us when it means on earth as it is in heaven. And this is what I continually hear the Lord saying, that he wants to make us an embassy of heaven. What is an embassy? Let's just write it down tonight. An embassy is, a, is, it is an official residence or offices of ambassadors. Write it down tonight because you're writing down your identity. This is who you are. You're an ambassador 
and you're a messenger for the kingdom of God. Say it tonight. I'm an, I'm an ambassador, and I'm a messenger for the kingdom of God. Say it again. I'm an ambassador, and I'm a messenger for the kingdom of God. So what is an embassy? If God's going to make us an embassy of heaven, an embassy is the official residence or offices of ambassadors. Now, let that connect prophetically for what we just prayed about our own property. Because I believe the Lord's going to do something very supernatural for us in this city to become an embassy of heaven. And it's what the Lord continually speaks to me about. How much heaven can we get in this region? <laughs> How much of heaven can we get in this city? Why don't you take it personal? How much heaven can you get in your home? Think about that. Just think about that. I've got about two more sentences and I'm done with this word. I'm kidding. <laughs> now you just need to chew on what I just said. How much heaven can you get in your home? How much heaven of the glory of God, the presence of God, the counsel, the wisdom, the mind of God, how much is actually available to us? Let your anointed imagination swim around in that for a little while. Would you do that? Let your spirit go there. Are you with me? It's an official resident or offices of ambassadors. So Matthew chapter 16, this is something that tonight I want to say right up front. Some of this will be new and some of this will be review. But this is very important tonight, even though some of this will be new and some of this will be review. The reason that we need review is because we need to continually feast and renew our mind to who God is and who we are and where he's taking us and where we burn to go. It's so important that we see ourselves differently, that we do not see us as just, you know, some, <laughs> oh my. The church that Jesus is building, folks, is, is just far exceeding and superior than just a campus that gets used a few days a week that serves good coffee and has contemporary services. God is courting us and wooing us to become an embassy of ambassadors and messengers and how much of the glory of God can we contend for and have the manifest presence of the glory of the Lord resting, resting tangibly upon us and people being sent out of that presence to be an ambassador to establish the kingdom in every sphere of society in this region. That's what we're getting a hold of. That's what we're getting a hold of. So Matthew 16, and you're there. It says, when Jesus, verse 13, he came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, and he says, who are men saying that the Son of Man is? And so they said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, and some say uh, Elijah, and others are saying Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, doesn't that put your brain on tilt that that was the way that they thought? You know, you know what? They knew that John the Baptist had been beheaded. Now, you, get your mind around this for a second. John the Baptist had already been beheaded. His head was served as a party display in Herod's, in Herod's courts. And so he's asking them, who are men saying that I am? And they're shuffling around. The, these stories are going around the villages and they're saying, some are saying that you're John the Baptist. Now that's a trip. That's people that must have believed in the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> right? Are you with me? Some are saying that you're Elijah or, or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And so he said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and he said, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Wow, I love to say that. Jesus answered to him and he said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father 
who is in heaven. And I also say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth, it will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I want to take a moment now, and I want to read this out of the Passion Translation, just a few of these verses. Right out of the Passion Translation, I know, it, I know they're going to help us on the screens tonight. And he says in verse 18, verse 18, he says, I give you a name, Peter, a stone, and, and this truth of who I am will be the bedrock foundation on which I build my church, my legislative assembly. Don't you miss that? Everybody see that? My legislative assembly, that word church we know is what? It, it is the word ecclesia. Ecclesia, that is the word that Jesus used. He said, I will build my ecclesia. And what is the ecclesia? It is the legislative assembly. Don't you miss that tonight? And the power of death will not be able to overpower it. I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven. Now, I love that word. I want you to go forth and I want you to forbid in the earth what is already forbidden in heaven. He's giving us our assignment as ambassadors and as messengers, as sons and daughters, that we are to forbid evil in this realm. See, Jesus would have never told us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven if it were not possible. If it were not possible, he never would have trained us and told us to pray this way. So he said, I am sending you out, and I want you to know, I want you to forbid every vile thing and evil that is already forbidden in heaven. Don't you miss that tonight? And then I want you to release on earth that which is released in heaven. Oh, my. I am a releaser. I'm a carrier of the kingdom of God. You are a releaser. You are a carrier. You have been given authority. You have been given authority. Authority. Now see, Jesus' life and ministry, it plainly demonstrated exactly what he's saying. Jesus went about forbidding evil. That's what he did. These weren't just words you know, his, his apostles, these disciples that were being trained, all they had to do was watch his life. All they had to do was watch his life. All they had to do was watch his life. And they watched his ministry. What was Jesus sent forth to do? He was sent forth into this world that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's what it says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. Jesus was sent forth from the Father. Why? That he might destroy the works of the devil. All they had to do was watch him from town to town, village to village. All they had to do was watch what he declared. He was forbidding evil and he was releasing life. Are you seeing this? This is our assignment. This is how you and I are supposed to function and live our lives and flow even in the ministry of reconciliation that God has called us to. We are releasers of life. Come on, are you with me tonight? Four of you are with me. You are a releaser of life. You are a carrier of the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So all they had to do was watch Jesus. And what did he do? He started releasing heaven's authority. I love that. He was releasing the kingdom realm. My God, I love that. Jesus released the kingdom realm of life and wholeness and healing and fullness of joy. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, he says that the kingdom of God, it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Let me say it to you like this. Everywhere Jesus was going, his ministry was the very release of righteousness. Everywhere he went, he was dispensing righteousness. 
That means that when I get up and I pray, Father, everything you do is right. You know what that is? That's righteousness. Did you hear me pray that earlier? Father, everything you do is right. That means that what God builds is perfectly right and perfectly aligned, structurally pure. Nothing can contaminate it. It is perfect in every way. Just drink on that while I take a sip. Think about that. It's righteousness, it's peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so he said, I'm going to build my ecclesia. I'm going to build, write it down tonight, my legislative assembly. This is important. What is a legislative assembly? It's that which is full of ambassadors. It is an embassy of heaven. And I have, I, I have this vision that I have been pregnant with by the Holy Spirit for so long And the Holy Spirit has been courting me and courting me with this vision about how much of heaven can be released on a family. How much of heaven, how much of heaven, how much of the realm, how much of the realm of God, how much of the realm of God can be released tangibly? What if the Lord started manifesting amongst us angels all the time? What would the kingdom realm feel like? I mean, what, what, what would happen? Man, I could tell you some stories tonight that would stretch you. We need stretched. We need some Holy Ghost stretch marks. <laughs> There's something that the Lord is trying to give us in the realm of revelation that he wants us to capture as a family. He wants us to build him a throne. He wants us to build him a seat of authority here. He wants us to become, I'm going to say it again, he wants us to create a seat of authority. Those of you that I took to Israel, I took you to the Knesset, not on accident. I took you to the Knesset on purpose. I took you there deliberately. Why? It is the seat of authority. Every branch of that democracy is under that roof. I took you there to pray on purpose. Why? It is the seat of governance. You understand? God wants us... and. How is it going to happen? Because we're smart enough? No. Because we're just awesome enough? No. That we're just sly and and slick and fashionable? No. No, no, no. Revelation is what establishes authority. Write it down tonight. Revelation is what establishes authority. Revelation is what establishes authority. Authority. The Lord wants to give us revelation of what it actually means to be the embassy of heaven in the earth. So that we can begin to release the wonders and power and the dominion of God in the earth. How much heaven can we get? I'm I'm on a quest and I really want to know. This isn't for, you know, getting people all excited and getting some adrenaline amens. I, I'm telling you, I want your spirit to be hooked tonight. I want you to be fully embraced by God and let Him begin to court you into this something that is experiential. Something that is experiential. Something that is tangible. When Russ Klein and his wife Kim were standing here last week and I heard that Once again, God is wooing us and He's courting us. He wants to release His the revelation of His heart to us. I took that very seriously. I hope you did too. The revelation of His heart. The revelation of His heart. Because somewhere there are gonna be there's gonna be a people that's gonna tap into the heart of God on such a level. People are going to start suddenly saying, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but heaven has crashed down there. Heaven has crashed down there. Are you with me tonight? The church that Jesus is building, this ecclesia, I want to tell you what it is. 
It is an apostolic force. Write it down. I'm going slow tonight. It is an apostolic force. And it is a force that will triumph over all the works of the devil. <laughs> Who do you say that I am? Peter, who do you say that I am? I want to review for just a moment. See, Jesus was, this question was so imperative. The question had to be answered. Why? Because revelation establishes authority. This question had to be answered. What are they saying? What is Jesus doing? Is, I, will, I will bet a wager here that I don't think Jesus was really worried about his poll numbers. <laughs> Who do they say that I am? Who do they say that I am? I also want to tell you tonight that Jesus was not confused about his own identity. Can you imagine if he would have been? The Lord have mercy. Jesus was not confused about his own identity. When he asked the question, what was he doing? This is what he was doing. He was seeking revelation. He was inquiring and seeking. It, it, was, it was like, it, you know, put, taking the temperature of somebody. You just oh, open your mouth here and let, let me put the little thermometer under your tongue, you know. Uh, face over here, our good uh, in-house nurse, and I'm sure she's done that so many times. And, and the Lord's like just kind of taking their temperature and saying, okay, uh, you've been with me. You've been watching. You've been watching me forbid things. You've been watching me loose the kingdom realm. And uh, let me just take your temperature here for a moment and see if you're getting some things. Let me see if you're really tracking. You've been watching a long time. You've been following I've been sending you on some missions. Some good things have been happening, but now I I gotta I gotta raise the bar right now. I gotta ask you a big question, and I need to take the temperature. And so Peter experiences this amazing burst of spiritual clarity, and it's revelation, and it's revelation now that has transcended time. And I want to be very specific to say this tonight. It transcended time because in Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 and 5, it says that at, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. you got to hear this tonight. In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. Isn't that awesome? Come on, are you with me tonight? Are you, don't you leave me up here all alone. In the fullness of time. See, the reason why the Father told Peter this is because it was time. Did you hear it? Did you catch that? You got your catching glove on? The reason the Father spoke that to Peter in that moment is because it was time. This was a transformational step that would now change everything about Jesus' ministry and now change everything about the diet of what the apostles were going to be able to bear up under. This was going to transform everything that they've ever thought or ever wondered about or ever considered. My God, I'm telling you what, I feel like I'm preaching to 50,000 people right now. It's, I'm telling you. The prophet Isaiah, or the prophet Jeremiah, he said, Oh God, your word is like a fire in my heart. Your word is like a fire that is shot up in my bones. This has to become a raging fire within this family. I'm telling you, what, what we're exploring together, we're not just doing a little historical relic of the scriptures. We're not doing a little historical exit Jesus here. We're talking about a heavenly experiential reality. The Father knew it was time for this revelation to be unveiled, and that's how it was given. How do we know that? Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. 
Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. My Father has now opened your mind and your spirit, your heart, your spirit, your mind, and you are comprehending something from another dimension. And why is He allowing it to happen? Because it's time. And on our way, on our journey right now, God has wasted nothing. He has wasted nothing about your journey. He has wasted nothing about the failures, the problems, the setbacks, all the hardships. He's been walking with you. Come on, are you with me tonight? I am preaching to this house. He's not wasting a thing. And now there's things that's about ready to step into time. Time, time, I know a little bit about time, about rudiments, about rhythm, about drumming and staying in that rhythm in that time. There is something about the element of time, and Father said it's time to let this drop into the earth. There's some things that's going to drop. There's some things that are going to drop on us, on you, on you. There's some things that's going to drop on you, drop on you, that you will think completely different. You will be untrained from a religious system of boredom. Untrained from lifeless Christianity and taken in to experiential power, wonder, revelation, prophecy, gifts of the Spirit. The spirit of understanding will be so strong upon you. The spirit of wisdom will be so strong, exponentially strong upon you. Why? Because it's time for it to drop on you. I'm doing the best I can to bring this to you tonight. I'm Brian Gibbs, and I approve this message. Are you feeling this? <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This word, ecclesia, is my, you are my legislative assembly. What is that? It means that you have the power to release authority. Jesus was one who spoke with authority. They marveled at him. Hey, oh, I don't understand this guy. He just showed up uh, uh, from Nazareth. And uh, he, isn't he the carpenter's boy? But he's teaching with such revelation, inspiration, and authority. He wasn't confused. He knew who he was. He knew where he came from. He knew where he was going back to. He knew he had the authority to lay his life down. He knew he had the authority to take his life back up. And no one could take his life from him. This command I have received from my father, Jesus said. See, this is a watershed moment. You, we got to get this tonight. We got to get this. I'm telling you, I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to get it. This is a watershed moment of what is happening that Jesus is unveiling. Actually, the Father, i got to get my Bible right, the Father is unveiling. The Father is unveiling. He said, it's time. It's time for this to be released. I believe it's time for our property to be released. I believe it, Bren. I believe it. I believe it. This is a turning point in Jesus' message, and it would become the cornerstone of what it means to build the kingdom culture. It is the cornerstone of everything of what it would mean to build a kingdom culture. That I'm making you my legislative assembly. And what you forbid in the earth, it's, it's already forbidden in heaven. It's already forbidden. And what you release into the earth, the kingdom realm... It already has authorization to be moving in the kingdom of heaven above. And he said, Peter, this rock is none other than the rock of ages, Christ himself, that God is building upon. 
Listen to these things tonight. See, the, the, the disciples understood what ecclesia meant in their culture. We hear ecclesia, and, and it's kind of like, okay. But when they heard ecclesia, they had a grid because they were watching the Romans come in and implement ecclesia. Any nation that had ever been conquered by Rome, they sent in what is called an apostleship. And after the warriors had had been through combat and they they broke that nation down in war till they finally surrendered to Rome, they send out an apostleship and the apostleship had the highest teachers, it had the, the governors and everybody in the arts community and everybody in legislative community, it was called the apostleship, and they would send these leaders out to that nation to begin to instruct and disciple that nation to actually reflect and look like Rome. So that anywhere the Caesar would go, it would look exactly like Rome. Rome would come in, they would defeat them, then they would establish their culture. Do you see it? Are you seeing that? And that's why Jesus said, you're my ecclesia. You're my ecclesia. You're my legislative assembly. And everywhere you go, you should be showing people what heaven looks like. And you should be establishing the throne of my authority. On what you put your hands on. On what you speak over, on what you declare. That's why we're we're not going to relent saying this, that this city and region shall become a kingdom stronghold. Come on. Wow. They understood that the ecclesia, they were people who were given the authority to govern the affairs of cities. Don't you miss that? Don't miss that. They were given authority to govern cities, states, nations, just like a parliament or a congress. Hmm. Man, I feel something. I, I actually, I just want to back up for a minute because I, I just, I, I'm telling you, I feel things just. I'm not lost. I know what to say, and I've got notes. But I'm telling you, something, something's dropping in here. There it is. How much of heaven can we get? How much of heaven can we get? See, the church is not asking these questions. Because you don't. What most American churches are doing, they don't even need the anointing to do what they do. You don't even need the anointing. You you can have good administrational skills. You can have organizational skills, structural, structural business skills, and you can pull off a good church. You can whip that thing and put in the right little components, just like chocolate chip cookie batter. Stick your finger in there in that batter. We do that. Oh, that tastes great. Well, it's it's just like that right now. It's like prefab church. And it really doesn't matter if, if the Holy Ghost even shows up into that mess. They're not asking how much of heaven can we get here? What do we have authorization to? I'm telling you what, I I got out of that a long time ago. A long, 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 long time ago. And somehow God has so captured my heart in saying, son, I want you to have an embassy of heaven. I want you to have an embassy of heaven. I want you to have a house, a residence of ambassadors and messengers. That's how I see you, Doug Clark. I don't see you just in exit reality. You're a messenger. You're an ambassador. You're a son. You're a carrier of the fire of God. That's how I see you. That's how I think of you. That's how I pray over you. It's how I pray over my wife, my son, my daughter. It's how I pray over our relationships. God is, what level of authority and power does God want to give us? It all goes back to what is the cornerstone. It's the heart of the matter. It's the heart. God's wanting to give us a revelation of his heart. 
so that we will honor and esteem in covenant the heart of God so that we won't make fools of ourselves when he gives us authority. And even when the disciples were tripping up all over themselves, I mean, they were saying stuff like, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy that city? And he'd have to turn around and say, look, you, you don't even know what, what spirit you're of. That's not why I've come. They were still in this perplexed thing. They had to be reprogrammed how to even steward the kingdom. And we're still being renewed and reprogrammed in our code, in our coding <laughs> Are you with me tonight? Yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> and on this rock, I'll build my ecclesia in the gates of hell. It won't prevail against it. Don't you forget that on the other side of this. I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my embassy of heaven. And when I build my embassy of, of heaven, the gates of hell, they don't even prevail against it. <laughs> I mean, I, we need our minds renewed to this. We need our minds renewed to this. Jesus also said something about this house. He said, my father's house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. It will be a house of prayer for all nations. This church is radiant. This is a radiant church. This is a church that is actually pulsating with the glory of God. Bold. Humble. You know, you can be bold and humble at the same time. How do we know that? Jesus is the pattern. He's the pattern. You can be bold. You can see through all the religious BS. Excuse me. B.C., let's go B.C., bull crap. Are you with me? You can see they're all the baloney, all the religious baloney. Okay, that didn't go over so well. So. <laughs> Who is the ecclesia? Write down tonight. Who is the ecclesia? They were the elders. They were the social watchmen. Don't miss this term. They were the social watchmen. They were those that governed the affairs over what happened in culture. They made the decisions what would be permitted and what would not be permitted in their town, in their village, in their city. They were the ones that actually set the agenda for what would be allowed and be acceptable amongst their people. Remember that. The ecclesia were the ones that set governance. They legislative. What is the ecclesia? It's the legislative assembly. And right now, folks, do you understand? Oh, I don't, I, I don't want to. I don't. When I say these things, I, I hear myself, and I don't ever want to come off as if, as if I'm talking down to you. I'm talking to you. I'm looking you in the face, in the eye. We, we are face to face in this. But do we, do we really realize, do I realize, do we realize the transformation that the ecclesia is awakening to, to actually deal with culture? Not hide away from culture. Not be in hiding. But to actually go and deal with culture and transform culture. See, because in transform culture, because we've got sin running rampant in the streets. We've got sin running rampant in our schools, in our education. We've got uncleanness and filth and perversion running everywhere. When is the church going to stand up and speak to it? When, 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 it's going to cost us something to stand for the truth. Yeah. When I, I want to say this again. The ecclesia were the ones who set the agenda of what was allowed or would be acceptable amongst the people. See, I think it's absolutely disgusting and filthy that we're being pushed around 
to tell ch little children that are in school that they've got to have a transgender tolerance. I think it's vile. I think it's evil. I think it's vile. I think it's evil. I think it's perverting and twisting our children. Our children are now becoming science experiments. And where are we? Most of the church is in hiding behind walls, having an hour-long service with immaculate light shows and fog machines. And, and acting like they're doing God a favor by showing up. But they're not engaging their assignment. Something's wrong with all of this. There is a people who will be the embassy of heaven, who will be the ambassadors and the messengers. They will be fierce. They will do mighty exploits. Something is dropping in this room. Lord, let revelation establish authority. Let revelation establish authority. Wow. skip some of this. My gosh, what time is it? <laughs> Good. It's 8 o'clock. Good. <clears throat> Jesus commissioned us as his ambassadors. And he has given us the privilege to design the earth to reflect heaven's culture. One more time. Jesus has commissioned us as ambassadors he has given us the privilege to design the earth to reflect heaven's culture. Mm. This is why Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Don't let anyone tell you that that's not possible. If it wasn't possible, Jesus never would have taught us to pray it or to even imagine it. He's not playing with us. How much heaven is available for your family? How much heaven is available for your business, your company? How much, how much of heaven is available for this ministry? Donna, how much, how much heaven and glory is available for Radiant Forge? You know, I don't know if I've ever told this story. I was in a green room. In St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri. I was in a green room with people that I could say their names. And I think everybody in this room would know who they are. And we had just finished about a five or six hour glory meeting. And there was a woman in the green room. You know what happens in a green room after a meeting? People are eating appetizers and grabbing Cokes. And they're rubbing elbows and talking and doing. There was a lady there that was crawling on her hands and knees around the back of a couch. I want to get, I want to get this image seared into your mind right now. There was a woman crawling on her hands and knees around the back of the couch and by the lamp shade inside. And I saw her. I had no clue who this woman was. No clue. She came out in an area of a, uh, in between these two wedge chairs. And the man that I was serving at that time, this is, this is in 1994. He grabbed a hold of her head, the guy that I was serving, and he began to prophesy over her. And he said, you're going to have a worldwide ministry. This is what he said. You're going to have a worldwide ministry. Such favor is going to be given to you, such favor, and you're going to have media outlets everywhere. You're going to have so much favor, your, your face and your name is going to be known around the world. God's going to raise you up and give you a television ministry. He went on and on and on. There was a number of things that he said. 
And while he's laying hands on her, prophesying over her, nobody knew who that lady was except some of the people in that church. Her name was Joyce Myers. And the man that laid hands on her was Rodney Howard Brown, who I was serving as his personal assistant. All those, all those important people, they didn't even know who this lady was. She was a teacher, a teacher in that church. How much heaven? What can God drop on you? What can God drop on you? What level of sphere can he call us to? What level of sphere? I remember a dream. Caleb, you'll remember this, and I called you right away, and you were in that dream, and we were outside of our property, and we, there was a, a recording that was about to happen. A new album was being recorded in our Victory uh, Studios because in a dream that I had, we had built a recording studio so that worship albums could go to all the world through Victory. And it had just been reported to me, though, that it had been booked because Paul McCartney was about to record his last album of his legacy, and he wanted to do it at Victory. <laughs> Somebody out there saying, that's not God. God. God's not in that dream. I'll tell you right now, God's not. <laughs> I'm not going to give you the interpretation tonight. But I remember us standing outside of that recording studio studio on our property everybody asking me questions and they were they were already telling me McCartney's people has already booked booked out they're booked out on the ocean and they've already booked their places and this is really happening and the Lord was speaking to me in that dream about a specific legacy of a sound that could be released to the nations of the world that would transform culture are you starting to see it? Are you starting to see it? What could God drop on us? I, there, there was a guy named Brian. It was a good name. There's a guy named Brian. And his worship leader caused a split in his church. A terrible split. The church was running about 200 people. And the worship leader caused a horrific split up and took over a hundred people. And so they had about 70, 60, 60, 70 people left. They didn't have a worship leader. And one of the elders called Brian, and not me, Brian, they called Brian and said, hey, there's this lady in the church. She tinkers around on the keyboards, and uh, you may want to ask her to play worship next week. And Brian said, well, we need somebody. We need somebody. And so up stepped this little girl named Darlene Check. She said, yeah, I wrote this little song called Shout to the Lord. <laughs> are, are you with me? She wrote a little song called Shout to the Lord. Introduced it to the church. Yeah, it went somewhere. <laughs> it went somewhere. What can God drop on you? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> what can God drop on us? Wow. I'm not playing with you either. This ain't about adrenaline. We're not about hype. We're not about gimmicks. We're about real Jesus. Real Jesus. Man, I feel something. I feel something strong. I'm going to get back to this message another night. But here's my last point. I'm going to go here. The ecclesia recognizes, first and foremost, please write this down. The ecclesia they recognize first and foremost that Jesus holds all authority. Demonized systems cannot defeat them because the church that Jesus is building has been given the keys to forbid evil and permit the kingdom realm in the earth. 
Do you know Paul, I'm going to close tonight. Do you know the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 20, he says that Christ is the head of the church. There it is. Having built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Everybody see that? I want to give you a different, I want to give you two different words tonight. You see where it says apostles? This is what I want you to write down, sent ones. Sent ones. Sent, like, like, like next week we're going to the send. <laughs> Prophets. Write down the word visionaries. Write it down tonight. Visionaries. This is important. I feel like we need to land right here for just a minute, and then I'm, I'm going to close. Apostles are sent ones. Prophets are visionaries. See, they're, throughout America, most churches right now have been pioneered by pastor or shepherding or teaching gifts. Now, hear me very clear. The apostle is not more important than a teacher. A prophet is not more important than a pastor. They're all needed. And Jesus gave, Ephesians chapter 4, he said he gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. But the model is, is that we have been, I'm going to say, under an, a shepherding anointing of teaching, pastoring, and some evangelism. Some. Okay? But actually it says that the foundation is the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. You know, when you, when you walk up to the Sears Tower in Chicago, I've never heard anyone say, that's a magnificent foundation. You know why? It's because it's not even visible. You don't see it. You don't even see it. Are you catching this? There's stuff dropping in here. Are you getting it? It's not even visible. So the apostles and the prophets, they're foundational gifts to build the structure. I'm going to say it to you like this tonight. They're given to build the embassy, the foundation of the embassy of heaven. You know why? Because they're sent ones. And they're visionaries. And an embassy is what? It is a residence and the official offices of ambassadors. You catching this? See, Revelation is establishing us tonight. I'm telling you, we're getting this. It's happening. I can feel it in here. It's really happening. Revelation's dropping into here. I believe God's called us to be an apostolic house. And I believe that God's going to give us pastors. He's giving us. <laughs> He's giving us pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles, and prophets. And I believe that we're going to function in a way that God can give us more of heaven that we knew was available to us. I believe this. I pray you do. I pray you do. So go ahead and put your Bibles aside tonight.